Well, thank you so much. I think it's another example. Uh, we can see how better understanding of all these complicated regulatory pathways that are, don't necessarily change genes, but change the their expression, the patterns of expression can potentially have such dramatic effect on the organism. And uh, I think hopefully soon we all be grateful for the new potatoes. <laughs> uh, all right, so at this point, I would like our speakers come here in the, uh, the uh, speakers from morning session, uh, uh, Gary, if you would like, you can join as well. I think there were several uh, unanswered uh, questions also. Uh, what a, yeah. Okay, yeah, let's uh, so give an opportunity to, to ask more questions. I know there were more of them and uh, people got upset at me. I really wanted to ask the question and uh, <laughs> so I I had a warm up question uh, uh, for uh, Carolyn and uh, and Shuan. So if you were to look at the crystal ball, what you would and you see yourself five years from now, what do you think the single thing you would love to understand? Uh, about uh, the genome. The, yeah. well, of course, I'll have to personalize it to what I would like to see with our technology, <laughs> which I would like to be able to get the better resolution and to be able to have the correlated fluorescence and x-ray, but the higher resolution of, of both fluorescence and x-ray. We have built a cryo structural illumination microscope uh, so we can get a little bit better resolution than we've done with a cryo fluorescence tomography. Unfortunately, we have to write our own software because all of the existing SIM instruments use 2D software and we need 3D software. So we have to write some 3D software to do that. And then we have to figure out the way to be able to use the better resolution optics, maybe if it's just with a region of interest of, of the nucleus rather than the whole nucleus. So that's one direction I'd like to go is more correlative studies with uh, actually multiple technologies, the fluorescence, um, X-ray, and then some cryo ET as well. That's one thing I'd like to do. Which one? Yeah, I'd love to see a spatial um, at the chromatin level, the correlation of imaging with sequencing. So uh, like what showed this morning, this amazing change of chromatin state and, and how, what kind of a sequencing or chromatin filters are those. I think at that scale, that would be amazing. Right, question over there. Stuck myself in the corner. So, so in terms of engineering, I thought this last talk was particularly illuminating to, to one question, which is uh, the difference between um, embryonic stem cells and iPS cells and the off state of, of chromatin, which I think is um, different between mouse and human. And it is, for instance, the inactivation of the X in, it doesn't have, uh, the re-expression of the X doesn't happen in human iPS. So you, we really don't have the same model after re-derivation of, of uh, a system to look at inactivation of the X, you can't do that in the human, you have to do that in mouse embryonic stem cells. So I'm possibly for, for everybody, but specifically for our last talk, it might be an interesting question whether any of these tools could be engineered to make a better IPS cell in humans so we could look at these critical in, uh, issues of human development. I assume that question is for me, right? Yes, um, yes, um, that's a great question. What we're approaching that way right now, uh, we have some really interesting results. We can really edit in the mouse embryo without touching the sequence of DNA, and we can we can make changes. We have a lot more success with plan right now, but the question is, um, how do you achieve the group effect? Because uh, you know, if you just added one gene, one chromatin state, one one gene is not enough, right? And we dump uh, FTO in, which uh, 
affects the entire thing, right? Maybe some will be advantage, some may, might be deleterious. Uh, so we are using tricks to uh, try to target a group of a group of genes. Uh, for reprogramming, yeah, uh, that would be very interesting. To look at the reprogramming. We're, we're we're studying at a very low ground. We're looking at the stem cell right now. So we're, we're the, our first task we achieve the hematopoietic stem cell. We can expand the X wave of 10, 14 folds, and then when we put this into transplant um, for two generations, we can still achieve eight folds expansion of hematopoietic stem cells. So it's a good step. Mesenchymal stem cells. The next step, I think, the more we learn. Uh, the further we can, we can um, eventually would love to be able to have a way to, to program the, the chromatin state. I, I have one more question, Sean, for you. So it's, uh, I think in your data, you showed FTO cells after uh, demethylation. You mentioned that they are uh, resilient to drought, but you also said, but they seem to be resilient to almost everything else. Other stressors as well, right? Uh, what, what is what is going on there? Well, stressors um, are very different, right? Yeah, the, they're, they survive in alkaline conditions better. Like uh, last week, my postdoc rushed to me, showed me the tobacco you know, grow on sodium chloride. You know, we survive better. <laughs> Not sure that, that's a good news, but um, yeah. I think uh, I think these these plants, yeah, were growing cannabis, but we'll see. <laughs> that for that that that's for PhD recruitment. <laughs> um, these these plants are much just more robust. They're just more robust. They're you know the, this can be a long session to discuss why, but we feel like the, there's this state of plants, right? Unlike human, we can run away from. From, from anything, plants do not, right? Same plants survive in Amazon, in Chicago, Norway, there's the same plant. So we think there's this switch, um, we just turn them on if they're in Amazon, or a lot of sun and, and rain, it's just somehow turn that switch on, we still try to figure out. And for that reason, they're just more robust. Yeah, um, I actually have two questions for, for, for the first speaker. Uh, I, I'm a high energy physicist by training and biologist by trade. So two, two different questions. The so first question is, uh, what is the limit of, of your microscope? Uh, if it's redesigned, can you go to reach uh, resolution of single nan nanometers in, in 3D? The wavelength we use is 2.4 nanometers. So that's the theoretical limit, yeah. Okay, that was easy. Yeah. Now, now a hard one. Reaching, reaching theory is not always easy. <laughs> a hard one. So you beautifully showed uh, how, you know, stem cells, uh, the, the nucleus structure is so different from mature cells. Uh, and of course, then the question is, why don't we study that? And can you actually do, you mentioned the word biopsy once, I believe, but you didn't show any uh, bi uh, biopsy. Can you make a biopsy from a heart or brain? Uh, and actually freeze it in your pipette and do 3D reconstruction? Theoretically, <laughs> no, it, it's something we want to do. Uh, we have thought about that. We are making some, I don't think the glass capillaries have the strength, but we've been making some uh, quartz capillaries. And I think the quartz have the strength to be able to do something like that. We're gonna start with easier than biopsy specimens, but ideally that would be where we're, we could go with that is get some actual biopsy specimens. It's in the plan. Yeah. yeah, I also have a question to Carolyn. Um, your x-ray, your x-ray really seems very like remarkable. So it reminds me of like a visualized version of like an MR machine. So is it also possible to visualize and at the same time, like quantify the composition of the atoms so that we can actually do the NMR and the cryo M kind of thing at the same time? Yeah, I showed you the crystal of the uh, oxalate. So that was one where we went forward. We knew the atomic composition. We calculated what the linear absorption coefficient should be. You can do the same in reverse. And that's what the modelers did with the pancre pancreatic uh, insulin granules. They worked both ways, knowing the composition of the molecule that they were looking at, determined the atomic composition and the lack value it should be. And we took our lack values and worked backwards. So that was a really complex model that they did. 
going in both directions. Um, and so it is doable, not trivial, but doable. So it doesn't mean that we can also like um, visualize the structure of the like molecules, like macromolecules as well, not just the cells. It's not just the what? Like macromolecules or like uh, polymers. A, a visualize in what way? You're seeing the actual structure? Yeah. Again, we only, right now, actually the best resolution we anybody has received, achieved with soft X-ray tomography is 25 nanometers. That was just with a thin specimen. Um, but the best optics they've made are 10 nanometer. And they get tricky because what I didn't mention is that the nanofabricated device, the better the resolution, the harder they are to make. And the, not only do you need the rings being a, a finite uh, distance apart, but it's the aspect ratio that gives you the sensitivity. And so the better, higher the aspect ratio, the greater the sensitivity, then also they get very floppy as you make them. So though we have this theoretical ability to go to 2.4, that's still not really good enough to see um, molecular structure. Um, and I think that's going to be really challenging. We need some better optics. So I'm a master's student. I'm sure there's some undergrads and some PhDs in the room as well. It's a, kind of a higher level question for all of you, but for researchers starting their careers, what advice can you give about how to make a career out of a passion, especially in a space like this? <laughs> <laughs> That's a real tough one. And I, I, one thing I always say is, and you, you hit it right there with the passion because without the passion, don't bother. I think you really need to love what you're doing. Passion is number one. How do you find that career that gives you that passion? I have probably one of the least linear pathways to, to from where I started to where I ended up. So I don't think I can answer that. I, I just, I think what I would say there is chance favors a prepared mind. Look for the chances, look for the opportunities. And when you find something that you hits you, somebody you're sitting in the audience of some talk and that really strikes you as exciting, pursue it. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I, I you know that that um I think encapsulates it because basically it, it's, you know, I think any career in academics um, or industry or whatever is, is filled with challenges um, of different types. Um, and it's just extremely difficult if you're not passionate about, about what you're doing. It doesn't mean you, you, you have to be motivated all the time. <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean that, um, you know, you have to work 60 hour weeks. But it does mean that, you know, occasionally you're in the shower and you just start thinking about, you know, why neutrophils look the way they do um, or, you know, whatever. And they send out these DNA curtains. So that's, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, I think there's a lot more, I, mean, I think you know, old days, we had the luxury of maybe not worrying so much about career paths. And I, I, you know, mine was maybe a little more linear, but I definitely did not think in advance about where I was going to do my graduate work, where I was going to do my postdoc, what labs I was going to, you know, I joined the postdoc lab I went to because I was visiting some other lab and, you know, I went and said, oh, I just want to talk to this person. I just enjoyed talking to him. And I think, you know, it's, there's a lot more emphasis today on planning out what your CV is going to look like and all this sort of stuff. But I think it, and, you know, I understand it's different, but I think at the core, it's still about, are you passionate about, about science? And, and do you think about it when you know, you're doing other stuff? I had never heard of a synchrotron when I was in graduate school. I had no idea what synchrotrons were about. So it's, yeah. Well, yeah, and no, I just add, I think be curious, right? I mean, I think everything everybody just seen here, and 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 the thing about it as well, you heard it from Juan, you heard it from Carolyn, you heard it from Gary, um, even me, right? You know, um, people like to put barriers up, like you know, it's this or it's that, but it's not it's biology, right? You know, 
it's literally it's physics it's chemistry it's rna it's dna right and and um and sometimes it you can get really really narrow and then like and then you you don't see the rest around you right and so um and sometimes like again you know you could hear it in some of the talks it's like you know these things keep bugging these people it's like why didn't you give me this really lethal phenotype right and and sometimes uh you might need a technology or something and have to come back to that question but it's the anomaly right you know if the model doesn't explain everything there's something we don't know so don't force models onto things right because you know and and sometimes the answer is no and that that's an answer right because it tells you what it's not which allows you to discover what it is right as opposed to kind of following the kind of emperor's new clothes where everyone goes is this and it's and actually when you look at these things you go hold on that you know if that's the case then this couldn't possibly be these two possibilities can't coexist so so what is it and that's how i think you kind of find um um i think things that are new um and i think the other thing that i would say is that um fail fast right you know it's, it's <laughs> if you can like if there's a friday afternoon experiment that's great but um kind of see if you can kind of um um fail quickly and and do the last i always tell my students do the last experiment first right so uh just to speak to the competitive part because i think you know one of the things you know uh half the stuff you know um that you might hear you know it's already kind of done the next step is already done right but assume this right assume that if there's something kind of obvious or the next molecule done the thing right what's the piece after that and maybe go after that or if this is the principle you know and that's the discovery well, what are you, would you do with that information? And can you do that now? Then do it, right? Because then I think you actually get, um, it's, it's more thoughtful. Um, and if you don't do it, maybe no one else will, but it actually moves the field, I think, kind of forward, right? So, so, so the kind of don't be afraid to kind of go, well, if this is true, you know, you don't have to go from linear <laughs> to here, but it's like, if this is this, and there's this general principle, then this would imply that. And that's, I think, how you really find central kind of uh, push path. I could help but notice there are several aspects that uh, that are fairly common uh, across all of you. Uh, one of them is uh, you are doing transformative research. Disrupt you disruptors, every one of you. Uh, but at the same time, uh, your research also is highly interdisciplinary, or we can call it convergence. Uh, even if you look at the career trajectory that that you took, I think it's quite remarkable. Uh, you know, Claudia, you were trained as immunologist, right? Studying immune system, but your research clearly is much more broad than that. And we, we had a very vivid example of that in your talk today. Uh, Gary, uh, you know, you you keep saying that you're a biologist, but at the same time, you introduced the concept of phase separation in genomics, something that until quite recently, only physicists could understand. Uh, Carolyn is a biologist, by training, if I remember correctly, right? And uh, and you gave a talk that probably what nuclear physicist <laughs> would be happy to give, right? And and Schwann is I was uh, received his PhD in in chemistry, right? If I remember correctly, from MIT. And the uh, the examples of his work include synthetic uh, synthetic biology and uh, molecular biology and uh, genetics, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are. A lot of examples here of truly transdisciplinary research. So my question is, why is that it's so difficult to break the boundaries between fields and what can we do to get better at it? I think Gary hit the nail on the head this morning with communication. You have to be able to be willing to talk to people who speak a different language. I mean, I work with all sorts of people, mathematicians, physicists, um, modelers, et cetera. I'm curious. I like to talk to them. I like to hear how they do things. And it's just being willing to talk to people. <laughs> the first time, Sam Isaacson, the mathematician who did the modeling of how molecules move through the nucleus, we were chatting on the phone. He was describing the data he was seeing. We had a Zoom, not phone. And I said, well, what does it look like? He drew out the mathematical equation. <laughs> 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 waiting for an image of the mathematical equation so you know it's just that first reaction was was a little bit uh this this could be a problem <laughs> you know we talked about it and we still collaborate we have many projects <laughs> but yeah what if, if you show me an equation i think i think the other component is to be fearless 
And and I think that we're we're often taught to stay in our silos. Um, it's the safe bet, you know, I know how to do this. I'll just keep doing it and doing it. And that's to me counter to essentially not only, you know, being passionate, but also um, sort of following what the science shows you. I think, you know, there's a difference between engineering and and discovery based science, right? And And if you do discovery based research, then you're going to be faced with things that, you know, aren't what you're expecting. And the question is, are you going to pursue that or are you going to stay in your lane? And, you know, I mean, I gave one example, but this has happened to me over and over and over again. Um, and I'd say, you know, what few breakthroughs we've had have all been these types of, wait, why is that happening? You know, I'm always asking myself, what was I expecting? And is this fit? And, you know, especially with visual stuff, that's really a, a great way to go. So even, you know, the example I gave of that void, okay, we could just go, oh, that's really fun and throw that out. But that is what got us to that protein. And you know, we'll see what happens as time goes on. But if we had just ignored that, anyway, but I think you have to be fearless about, you know, going to places where you, you may, you may fear to tread. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I would just add, yes, I totally agree. So I think, I think, I mean, I actually think there's some great examples here based on my conversations over lunch is that, so first of all, you know, uh, don't be afraid to say, I don't know, teach me, <laughs> right? I don't know, tell me, right? You have to leave your ego. For me, cancer is a big driver, right? And I go, you know what? I don't care if you think I'm stupid, right? But I'd love to have an impact on a patient's life if you can help me. You know, I, I, I just don't care. Tell me, right? I really want to learn because I, I want to do that. And so, um, and that's, a, I think that's a big fear, right? Where you go, oh, as a physicist, I don't know, you know, I barely passed math, you know, uh. <laughs> right? But they don't know as much biology, right? And so we all have, you know, we all know different things and, and, and surround yourself with, I think, people who are better than you if you can actually again this is again an ego thing you want people around you that are better than you and have people in your lab that know things that are different to you right you know you can't possibly span everything right but i have people in my lab who know all these things right and that's amazing right because then it's real synergy or a real team right where, where where they can do things i couldn't even possibly dream of but we can start to i think that's how you start to break things down is having people bumping up against each other One's a structural biologist, one's a computational biologist, one's a chemist, right? You know, and, and we start to rethink, as you obviously have department structures, right? You know, classic department structures, which tend to have, if I have all, this many people all in the same place, you know, that think the same thing. Yeah, the problem is they may all think the same thing. Yeah. And what you need is a disruptor who thinks about that differently, right? And so, um, you know, because you know, the, there's a, a tendency for people to kind of recruit kind of more of the same that kind of agree with them. And I would say, no, you want people who challenge you in a constructive way um, and go, really, why do you think that? Where it's a genuine question, not a comment, like, why is that? Because then some, that's, those are the questions where I'm going, I go, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> actually, why do we think that? What is the data? And so, so, so I, I think, um, you know, um, uh, you know, leave your ego at the door, you know, that, that, and, and, and always be prepared to learn and, I know that you know things and they know things, but together, then you get, I think, magic happening, right? You said better what I was, the point I was going to make. Be, be humble. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I will add actually today is a lot easier, right? 20 years ago was harder, but today I think, uh, um, I, so I was actually the first question I, I, I um, you need to have a passion, but don't um, just jump into the first thing you're passionate about. Um, stay open-minded. Or you know, I, I tend to see these college students are great, but then um, you know the first scientist that they met is they decided to work on that. Maybe there's stuff beyond, right? Um, and once you identify a good problem, you your problem oriented, then uh, you seek out for help. Um, you know, you're humble. You know, you you don't know any, uh, anything or everything. You just go ask for help. Be passionate, be humble, be brave, 
right? Okay, that, that sounds like a really wonderful advice to uh, stream. Yeah. I can certainly learn myself. Oh, thank you. Well, I, yeah, my, I have, a, my, I have a question. I have a question okay, for Carter, um, because I didn't get to ask. Um, so in your star map, um, what are the chromatin filters at the peripheral that get pulled away? Do we know anything there special? You mean at the peripheral? Right, right. Actually, that, those seems to be the key to get pulled, and I start to have this. Uh... Yeah, well, so, um, so I think that's three. Come back, it's actually like it's that, yeah, and again, right, essentially, I think it's like, how do you have hydrochromogen against the structural activation at the same time? Actually, we take coexist, but if we have strings on, I know I need to try to switch to pass out of this. So we have to put on the bottom line. And so, one of the questions is that, again, um, um, uh, so if you, if you actually sort of have um, organization, depending on how to go to town, you actually very love that this. Okay. In that, um, you know, um, in, in a part of memory, basically, on the I don't even know the thing that's going to be done with this. That's not the kind of pull, basically, that is kind of structure itself to DNA out, right? That's an effect that on surrounding genes, basically, right, right. So, you know, you need to think about that. But the other thing is then, is that if RNA starts to build up, again, at the further, you start to concentrate on right, especially right. kind of things. They can start to drive almost their own sorts of uh, homocytic interactions, which then actually uh, are in some many ways like these cooler, um, and also actually start to compress things that they have on the inside. They can do a different groups of uh, uh, ionic or charge concentration. Right? So, so, so I think. Um, uh, uh, you know, you actually see some kind of hard kind of at the periphery, but there, um, uh, there is actually just um, sort of uh, you might access that at first, um, and it starts to kind of come undoed, but you start to build, you know, it's not like everything opens up. So you, right, right. So then you start to sort of build, build up things, but if you have motors, they can push the motors. Right, wonder whether there are racial transposon elements there, introns there, or enhancers there. No, yeah, uh, so basically, as well as you know, you, some of those particles that we see in the protein, you can actually see on the periphery as well of um, you know, kind of some of the chromosomes. So I'm not sure if that's to do with uh, sort of an RNA decay measure, basically, and an RNA decay method, basically, or an RNA. You get time to repeat or sort of viral uh, by direction. Start to get RNA DNA hybrids, even, right? Which do get things that actually can actually put the zone. Um, uh, create actually then RNA boundaries at the periphery of DNA uh, at the lanes, which actually really give you different uh, different phases and actually different models. So I think it's a, it's a fascinating question in terms of well of the RNA DNA and how other basically um, neutralize um, them or actually not necessarily the RNA. And our transcription in that itself, right. it creates the RNA that can feed back because, again, biology never wants to generate a condition to print it, uh, to turn on the condition to turn on, right? So I think, I think it's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. About dynamics and about stochasticity. And so I think that, that you know, it's not silent and active. Yeah. It's not that there's a specific sequence out there that's doing this or doing that. It's that these are objects that are constantly in motion and, and not static. And so all you need to do is have one piece come out at one moment that the RNA polymerase can grab onto and it, it's, it's that. So I, I think, you know, this is back to the original questions about dynamics. If you, if you, if you think too literally about it's either this or that and not include the fact that there's a lot of dynamics and stochastic behaviors and it's the ensemble that matters right then it, it, at least for me it becomes easier to think about how you can transition from one state to another
Yeah. You have a virus coming in, or you yeah. have a signaling. Let's say you activate a, you know, fast way or whatever. Uh, you know, then you, what's your landing path? We increase the probability after. Right. Um, I mean, I think one thing that's again really interesting. I think about the unknown stress idea, right? Like PMO bodies, what are PMO bodies? So, so again, it, it's kind of the idea of containment. Like the virus can be paid far too quick, right? So, um, so I can get a wide version of some ways of sort of like, how do you come to that? So, do you detect the changes in uh, what we call nuclear volume, right? Because a mutant genome kind of expands and we just sort of think about it. have a really interesting effect on free biodynamically. Of a on this so you know, all these kinds of change of homeostasis, which is a universal signal of an RNA virus in a virus, right? And the other thing is, is some people, you know, this is how it's going to be later with um, herpes virus, and uh, as far as the high school ladies, actually, the high school ladies, actually, get silenced in so it has this kind of stuff that just glitches and stuff like that, but it will actually. Uh, as opposed to trying to six candy bars and bars, it's just kind of six pieces right in the middle and get these PMO bodies that see repetitive DNA, while the PCNX in all these different regions. The NHC will just break the world in these bodies, which are driven again by actually kind of condition. So it's like you set up these kind of mentally that it's a problem spaces that take this kind of um, repetitive homotypic interaction to guarantee them. Now, when they don't have the, they don't have necessarily any functions, but something when they don't speak to lots of the other elements, now we have a big problem. And that's what we will do in the game today. Right? Kind of like an IGN inside the cell. Well, thank you so much, uh, Schwan, Carolyn, Gary, uh, Claude. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure and privilege to have you. I learned a lot. I think everybody here learned a lot. And uh, thank you. <laughs>